I'm joined with Shannon. Uh, Shannon has been is a is a father, is a parent, um, and has direct experience in how this indoctrination and this war against our children impacts families directly. And he has spent a great amount of time researching and understanding what is happening. And I welcome Shannon to Scuttlebutt Lodge to help inform and make people aware of just how this attack on our families is happening and how their institutions are normalizing this outrageous behavior. Shannon, thanks for joining me. I'm happy to be here, Randy. Uh, it's a difficult subject to talk about. There's a tremendous amount of uh, depth to it. I've been studying policy and where this policy came from and, and these sets of policies came from in Canada uh, for a number of years. And um, you know, we have a situation in our, in our schools. I mean, the, the, the left-wing activists love to use the word systemic. Uh, systemic means it's it's baked into the institutions and we have systemic problems leading to very negative outcomes for children including uh, sexual mutilation sterilization r rendering children incapable of uh, w when they become adults of of the pleasures of intimacy in their lives um, and it's all wrapped in these pretty colored flags mm -hmm. And called inclusion. The pride, the LGBTQ. Yep. Plus, plus. Yep. Rainbow. The, my biggest concerns are the, T, the TQ. And, and in Canada, the, um, the groups that formed in the 80s and 90s to fight f for resources during the AIDS crisis, the LGB community, uh, lost the war this narrative war, this ideological war, back in 2017, when uh, the Toronto Pride Parade was publicly hijacked by trans activists. Mm -hmm. And they blackmailed the Toronto Pride Parade and they brought in all of their intersectional ideology, meaning the, the oppression hierarchy, right? In, in, this, mm -hmm. in this ideology, they, they measured- They were the most oppressed, so they're at the correct. top there. So they should be at the top and, yeah. and they demanded they shut down the parade. They demanded that they have seats at the board table and that they get special recognition and and that uh, that that pride cave, and pride did cave. Mm -hmm. The LGB community is actually one of the groups that's really concerned about this because mm -hmm. the TQ has hijacked everything. That 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 aside, those those TQ those those trans and queer activists have been trying to get policies into law. And, and from school boards, uh, through provincial uh, legislation, through federal legislation, even municipal legislation, to um, so-called protect trans rights. And trans rights are actually um, involved taking rights away from other people right. and imposing their views on the world. And they claim that it's a human right for them to not be questioned. But so this, uh, this TQ activism, how do we see it um, uh, in our institutions? What, how, what happens, what is the impact on that, that child? Take us through the steps of um, how this indoctrination plays out throughout the, that child's life. Yeah. Um, you know, we know that there's some confusion and then we, and we know it's a progression with puberty blockers and Yep. And then medical intervention, and so maybe take us through that uh, uh, that stage or how yeah. how it's impacting a so, child. So I look at what's happening to kids in schools, and I look at it in four stages. Okay, and, and the first stage is is the indoctrination that starts early, uh, right from kindergarten and grade one, when kids are kids are introduced to pronouns. It's the very idea that you could be born in the wrong body and might need a different name and different pronouns. It's very confusing. Right. So. Uh, indoctrination and then when kids become confused there's affirmation and then there's medicalization and the medicalization leads to sterilization right so indoctrination affirmation medicalization 
sterilization. So the indoctrination is the subtlety. That's where the, the teachers ask the, the child, you know, uh, how do you want to be uh, recognized, uh, he or she or they or exactly. them? And it's, it looks and feels pretty benign at that level. Yep. But it throws in a big monkey wrench into the development and the understanding of that child. It's it's completely psychologically and emotionally inappropriate at the stages that these are being introduced to kids. Lots of people think that this is part of the sex ed curriculum and it's really the sex ed curriculum that's the problem. And we could talk about that separately, but really where this is coming in in the schools is under the anti-bullying uh, legislation and the and the so-called human rights uh, policies uh, of the school. And so this allowed uh, this idea of pronouns and language, and uh, you may have heard a lot about uh, the kinds of books that are available to kids, mm -hmm. queer baby, and you know, uh, uh, this we'll book speak is, about this that book is gay. After and the, as well, and the, so yeah. there are there are a tremendous amount of materials and resources put into uh, into so-called acceptance under the anti-bullying that never got any public scrutiny right. Right. whatsoever. So the, we all know that every 10 years or so, we have a big discussion about mm -hmm. the sex ed curriculum, and it's an important discussion to have. But this, is, um, this has been uh, brought in uh, in Trojan horses, yeah. and it's infiltrated our schools. And because this is the policies and the activists love to silence people, they claim any question of it is a violation of human rights. Right that it's erasing trans people or, or even causing but this, a genocide. But this sex curriculum does lead into the second stage after the indoctrination or as a bridge or a part of the indoctrination and now into the affirmation, you know, where um, children now are exposed to, I would say, inappropriate uh, sexual literature and comics and yep. different things, and uh, and then they uh, begin to be even more confused, and they'll start maybe altering their name, or start wearing different clothing. That's right. And uh, and to see if they're going to be more accepted by the teacher or more accepted by. Um, Individuals, and that's the uh, that's the affirmation process that you yep. were talking about, um, and and then okay uh, when when the teacher sees little little Johnny while he's wanting to wear pink, or he sees um, little Betty. Um, uh, wanting cutting her hair short and uh, um, and uh, not want and wanting to um, play rough and tumble, that's when they say, "Okay, well, you yeah. maybe are, you're the opposite sex. Maybe you were born yeah. in the wrong body." Well, what we need to really understand is both of these first two phases are are enforced by legislation. Mm -hmm. Okay, the idea that a member of a public, a publicly regulated profession, someone in the public mm -hmm. sphere, misgenders you. Mm -hmm. If I called you a she, that could be a violation of your human rights. Mm -hmm. The teachers in Ontario and across the country walk on eggshells under threats of human rights violations. So if a child says for some reason the teacher misgendered me, that could be seen as a human rights violation and cause for the teacher to be investigated. And, and dismissed. And dismissed. Uh, the, I mean, the, the, we're seeing that the investigation is in the process is the punishment mm -hmm. that can go on for years in, in some of these instances. So the teachers are very, very, uh, the, let's say they're, they're hemmed in mm -hmm. on what they must say and what they can't say. And, uh, and so there is a perverse sort of structure that encourages them to play the pronoun mm -hmm. game. And then the affirmation is, is regulated at the provincial and federal levels. So a year ago, uh, January, at the end of 21, beginning of 22, Bill C-4 went through and passed uh, into law, and that's the anti, um, what is it, anti-conversion conversion therapy bill. Yeah. And 
you know, realistically in Canada... That prevents any professional... Correct. Any professional from not affirming that... That's right. ...perversion or that Where that people can lose their licenses, they can lose their careers. Mm -hmm. So if little Johnny one day says that he's a Sally, mm -hmm. uh, or he thinks he might be confused by the pronoun game, mm -hmm. and the whole this whole idea that, you know, could I be a boy or could I be a girl, then the teacher... And the administration must affirm the child, right. or again, this is legislatively enforced. They're in a bind where they could lose their jobs. Right. So, with that affirmation, the child is going to get more attention, more positive attention, yeah. um, and uh, be more. How should I say? Uh, more encouragement for being strong for 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 altering um he's going to be he or she's going to be surrounded by all this positive energy of the falsehood yep. uh, and that's reinforced with the legislation and then invariably that says okay well i can get even more attention uh, i can get even more positive energy if i take another step Yep. Um, and not just uh, be affirmed, but now begin the medical stage yep. of this indoctrination, this medical stage of this perversion. And, yep. and that um, that is where we get into the, um, the puberty blockers. And That's right. So again, legislation um, on the and the what's called the affirmation only model. Um, leaves no other options open to the child. There are there are policies in school boards all across the country and more frightening ones in the um, in the social uh, work field, especially in British Columbia, um, that that say that if a child feels unsafe, and unsafe is one of those newfangled yeah. woke words, it means if their feelings might be hurt or their identity might be questioned, mm -hmm. Uh, and, you know, vis-a-vis -vis this, this uh, uh, affirmation only, mm -hmm. that you might be converted if, if, yeah. you, if someone says, well, actually, you have a penis, you're a, you're a boy, yeah. um, that schools will keep this, these social transitions, which are powerful psychological interventions conducted by schools and teachers, they will keep that secret from parents. From parents. Yeah. That's what happened to me. Yeah. You weren't aware of... What was going on behind the scenes nope. in your child's life, and, and that, that's a fact that many of us uh, are are likely unaware of if we have children. Yeah. If our children become gender confused, um, largely at young ages through the school system, but then in the social media world when they start to go looking, you, see, mm -hmm. you type in Google, "How do I know if I'm transgender?" Yeah. Um, and you know, pages and pages come up that say, "If you're asking the question, it probably means you are." Right. So this is this pathway that we're running children through until they get to the gender clinics. Yeah. Now, I live in Ottawa, but it's the same story across the country. Uh, last year, the uh, pediatric endocrinologist, this is the doctor at CHEO, the Children's Hospital East in Ontario, was interviewed in uh, CTV uh, Bell Media and said that in 2014, the year they started, there was about a dozen kids presenting at the clinic with some kind of gender confusion. And at the end of 2021, she had estimated between 200 and 250. Right. And this is this isn't a straight line going no, up. This is this a, is a this is a, an, exponential. an exponential curve. Yeah. So we can anticipate based on comparisons with clinics all over mm -hmm. that we may be in the 300, 400, or more children a year presenting just in just in Ottawa. Ottawa. Just in Ottawa. Uh, and they're presenting, the, the euphemism is gender-affirming care. What we're yeah. talking about is sex changes for children. Yeah. And this starts, in, uh, I'm not sure if it's different in every community, but uh, in every jurisdiction, but I'm hearing that uh, children as young as 12 in most jurisdictions in Canada can now be administered these medical interventions that will prevent them from attaining puberty that will, if they're a boy, start uh, shrinking, shrinking their penis, uh, shrinking and um, the, the testicles. Uh, for females, uh, 
prevent breast development um, and start the long-term destruction of ovaries. Um, and that's, and th these things are irreversible. Once you start down that path and continue on that path, the dosages get increased, the, um, the breadth of blockers get increased, and more and more, which becomes irreparable harm, is done to the reproductive yeah. um, abilities of that child. Uh, and that will be completed, that destruction, if started at that age, is completely destroys uh, long before puberty for these children. Um, but then, but then there's another step after that. Children. So that, that's the medicalization process. I mean, there's technical words. Tanner stage two is a particular stage of puberty where if mm -hmm. kids are put on these blockers, they won't develop the secondary sex characteristics. So the boys' voices right. won't deepen, their shoulders won't broaden, right. girls' hips won't enlarge yeah. to, you know, to, to accommodate childbirth. pregnancy and yeah. for childbirth. And, um, and, and uh, Marcy Bowers, who is a, a man who identifies as a woman, who is a pediatric, uh, well, she's a, a gender surgeon and, and uh, uh, prominent in this uh, uh, barbaric mm -hmm. field, has said, you know, a, a boy truly at Tanner stage two, if he's administered mm -hmm. puberty blockers, um, will never experience an orgasm mm -hmm. and will be infertile. Uh, so this is the sterilizing of a child who, who can't possibly know who they are no. uh, at the age of 10, 11, 12. When, when... And let's not forget, you know, it was not long ago where there was a great public debate and outcry and discussion about the forced sterilization of of intellectually disabled people and we as a society said that was wrong you yeah. cannot sterilize people who can't give and consent. indigenous women too and, yeah um, absolutely and that that's in my lifetime i remember yeah. that uh, debate and of course you know that uh, stemmed from uh, the eugenics uh, programs that were uh, popular with the Nazis Third Reich of, of sterilizing the less than ideal people. Um, yep. um, and it, it has, a, eugenics has a long history. But it, then it's even more like, so once those children who now no longer can, the little Johnny who can't be Johnny anymore, um, you know, he, and will never be Johnny, then there's another medical step from there, and that or or little Sally, who can't ever actually be Sally again. There's another step beyond the puberty blockers, and that's where they um, harvest skin and tissue, and for little Sally, they'll take off large portions of skin and muscle and. Um, tissue and uh, create a a penis uh, or a, something a that facsimile a non-functioning yeah. facsimile yeah. Of, a, of a male yeah. sexual organ something and that for, will never work and for little Johnny they'll do similar but in the reverse yeah um, they, call um, it, they call it a penile inversion a penile. to create a a false uh, yeah. vagina um, these are barbaric uh, medical interventions yeah they and, don't. They don't happen. Again, they don't happen in all cases. No. Um, but uh, it, it, you know, breast removal is very common. Yeah. For uh, uh, young what's the term? The, I heard this uh, outrageous uh, top literally. No, it was a, a, a physician who said uh, uses the terminology "yeet the teeth." Yes. Um, you know, making fun and light of surgically removing a young girl's breasts. Um, but, but again, there's one other element of that, Shannon, I think that we have so quickly forgotten. Again, not that long ago, we outlawed uh, uh, the cultural practices 
of other cultures that F have come here. FGM. Uh, yeah. Female genital mutilization was not that long ago. We said, well, that is a barbaric practice. That is an atrocious and harmful practice. And, uh, and if your culture does that, it is unlawful to do it here. Yeah. But now we can do far more extensive female genital mutilization if it's under the guise or the pretext of... Of, of human rights. Yeah, of human rights. And, and inclusion. Yeah. yeah. For young girls who go on, so they start with puberty blockers. We know that it, the number is 98.7% of the time, according to some, some uh, data from the UK, kids go on to cross sex hormones. Mm -hmm. Now the advocates love to say, well, it's a pause button. It's an opportunity to reflect and, and, and buy some time to make a decision. But it really isn't. The starting puberty blockers is the start of the sex change. Then the cross sex hormones are, are uh, mm -hmm. implemented. For young girls, that will, uh, that will uh, create what they call bottom growth. Right, right. So the, the clitoris will grow and the, vet, the vagina will atrophy and shrink, and right. so will the, the ovaries and, and the... Uh, so that's administering male uh, hormones yep. and the testosterone and whatnot to girls and uh, administering estrogen and other um, female-associated hormones uh, yep. um, to boys. For, for young women, that, that testosterone uh, and the atrophy of the reproductive organs can be... Um, so damaging to their bodies that within three or four or five years they have to have a hysterectomy. They have to right. have their reproductive organs completely removed, um, so that they become uh, uh, utterly sterilized and, and, right. and incapable of, of bearing children. And that is the final stage. Well, that is the. I shouldn't say it's the final stage because we've seen so many people who have then realized that this whole process was wrong and I've either gone and attempted a detransition. That's right. We've also seen significantly higher suicide rates for um, these youth and, and children. Um, so it's, but the next step of course is, and that's the, um, is the sterilization that all these children um, who became affirmed yeah, and who did in many cases were encouraged and incented through positive energy um, of this um, indoctrination now will never have the rewards of being a parent themselves, of, right. of experiencing uh, what it is to um, uh, create life through love. Um, yeah, it, it, it's a it's a horrible tragedy. I've talked with a couple uh, detransitioners, young women, and um, and and certainly heard the testimony of many many others. Um, and something happens to them when they reach a certain age in their twenties. You know, uh, uh, women talk about their their biological clock, and mm. uh, um, we have a lot of. Uh, colleagues and, and friends and people we worked with in our in our lives they're in their 30s and they talk about this about wanting to have babies and something happens in, even in in some of these people who've transitioned and undergone the testosterone where they it's, it, something clicks and they realize oh i i maybe wanted to have children yeah and you hear the the, the devastating regret um that these people share right. and live with every day um, it's, it's, that in itself is horrifying. And what's more horrifying is the censorship and the, and the, um, bullying, the name calling. I mean, people lose their jobs. Mm -hmm. We were talking earlier about uh, young Josh Alexander, who's the, the mm -hmm. young man from the Catholic school in Renfrew, not far from here. He was expelled from school. His parents are both teachers. In well, a different school board. In a different school board. And, uh, Someone a few weeks ago put a, a um, rainbow sticker on uh, his mom's, uh, I think, kindergarten classroom door, mm -hmm. grade one. She teaches a very early primary uh, without her permission. And she took it down and was reported for this mm -hmm. and suspended and is under investigation right. for 
for hatred. Well, listen, I think what we, for all parents out there, all parents who have children in some form of public education or otherwise, whatever, but especially for public education, the number one thing to do is talk to your children and find out what's going on in their classrooms. Absolutely. Find out if it's impacting your child. Um, uh, but the next thing is join us on this day of action on June 9th. Come out, uh, take part, and defend your family. Defend your child. And because um, I don't believe, Shannon, that a child entering in our public school system today, if we don't win this war, if we don't fight back, a child entering school today will be devastated. All, every child will be devastated and tragically harmed or not live a very long life uh, the way we're going. Yeah, that's a big concern. A couple things that, that people can do. June 9th, we're uh, calling for a day of action. That action can take a number of different forms. Uh, it might be as simple as starting now uh, because Pride Month starts in June. Actually, it's Pride season now, according to the Government of Canada. It goes all the way to September. Um, and there are activities in your child's school. To contact your child's teacher and to contact the school principal and ask what the planned activities are, demand the schedule for the month of June and the Pride festivities, and whether they're going to bring in external speakers or performers, as we've seen in many schools, where drag queens are coming into the schools, um, and, and so-called storytelling, um, and, and to uh, start the process of letting the administration know that you are, you are concerned and you have questions. Now, you might want to be careful in some jurisdictions because, unfortunately, in British Columbia, Child and Family Services can investigate you and threaten your custody rights if they feel you don't affirm your child sufficiently. Mm -hmm. So in your own home, if you don't sufficiently make the words of the state doctrine with your family, you can lose custody of your children. There are other actions that you can undertake around this event on June the 9th. Uh, contact me, uh, we're coordinating this huge range of people who have these concerns very successful Muslim pushback in Ottawa mm -hmm. that I'm, I, I kind of took this idea from. They kept their child, their children home from a school in Ottawa last year. 70% of the kids stayed home. Mm -hmm. Another one of these events, again, Muslim community in southern Ontario, one day kept more than 30% of the kids home. No explanation, mm -hmm. just kept the kids home. But, uh, I, but I think, you know, uh, once people get to be aware of what's going on, uh, there is one thing that, I, I'm confident that every parent will want to do, um, and, and I think we must do. Our public education system is receives their money based on child enrollment. Uh, consider and find ways, uh, either through private schooling, Christian schooling, faith-based schooling, um, homeschooling, cooperative schooling. Yeah, learning pods is a, yeah. is a thing that's emerging. If you want to ensure that your child grows up to enjoy life, to be happy, to be having a rewarding life, um, you will need to consider what's happening to your child in public education right now. And uh, anyway, join us on June 9th. The links are included in the, um, in the video. Uh, and look forward to seeing you out there uh, defending your children and your families on June 9th. Thanks. I hope you enjoyed today's video. Make sure to like, share, and follow. And if you'd like to spend some time at Scuttlebutt Lodge, click on the link below. I look forward to seeing you here at the Lodge.